Hi, everyone. Um, uncertain, fragile, weakened. Powerful, evocative and frightening words to grip audiences in the midst of a global pandemic. But how representative are they? And do they hold any value for leaders focused on building tomorrow? I'm your host, James Tassfield, and I'm joined by a stellar lineup of guest speakers from across the world tonight. Excited to tell you about themselves, their businesses and their vision for a post-pandemic world. Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we begin, uh, it would be great to see who we've got joining us online. So if you want to drop your name and where you're from in the chat box, or as we go along, if you've got any questions for any of the uh, panel members, please drop it in there and we'll try our best to answer questions. Um, we have a kind of series of different topics that we're going to we're going to talk to. Um, but if we just jump in, then we'll get a, a good sense of, of kind of who we've got here and, and who wants to contribute, depending on uh, the question at hand. So what I'd really like to start with is obviously we're in a, a particularly complex time for all of us, I think is probably the easiest way to say it. Um, and with or without a global pandemic, life is incredibly complex. Um, so what I'd like to begin asking our panelists tonight is, is how do you tend to navigate complexity, both personally and professionally? And if we, um, I can kind of either choose one of you or, or one of you can feel free to jump in, depending on who would like to begin. Um, I'll go for, I'll go for Karam here, just because you're right next to me on my screen. I knew you would pick here and then. <laughs> Exactly. We saw that, we saw that might happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, feel free to, um, to kind of contribute right so, now. So on that, your initial question, I think we, I tend to see it as a, we are right now all in the same boat literally um, and I think when you start with that uh, as the uh, basis for either running your business in my case I am, uh, run a learning company so we build uh, educational infrastructure for for, for schools and uh, higher education and corporate training um, or you look at it from a personal perspective uh, everyone is in the same boat and when you have that as a basis you need to probably go back to the Second World War or something like that, when the whole world was in a state where, regardless of our backgrounds, we have something, a stress that is in common. And I think that as a leader, it will help uh, when you run um, part of your company uh, to be able to, 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 at an eye level, so to say, like now, um, try to figure out how do we get through this. I'm sure we will get through it but how we will get through it. And uh, as, as personally, so with, with family, um, you do the same. Because even my four-year-old, she knows what corona is, right? So it actually gives some, I think, interesting opportunities. Where word interesting is probably, I would say, controversial to use in that sense, but I think everyone knows what I mean. So that, that would be my kind of, um, kind of start for the conversation is that what opportunity do we have now that we are all in the same boat? That's how I will start the kickoff, my, my little contribution. I don't have the answer, but. And Rolf, how would you, um, how, would, how would you tackle this as an area for yourself, given, given Karam's comments and, and your perspective on this? Mm, so I, first of all, I think we should be very thankful for the complexity. Um, because I think, I think on one hand, yeah, the world might be complex, more complex, but foremost, I think we have more information and that's why we perceive the world as more complex. Yeah. And I think that's, and, and, and so that's why I think a lot of people are always struggling and saying, oh, it's all so complex. No, it's complex because we have today, we have way more information. We, we know what's going on in China. We know what's going on in the U.S. We know what's going all, uh, on all around the world. We have a lot of information, uh, very detailed information, and that it gives us the power to take better de decisions, right? So I mm -hmm. think, first of all, accepting that complexity is ultimately not something bad. You know, it's 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 basically it's it's a it's a direct result of more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I I think that gives that's already like puts it puts you rather in power than into a struggle and i think that is a very important perception you know like I, and i perceive it as okay we have a lot of power because we have that information we have the chance to 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 use that complexity to to create 
better solutions. And and I think then, I think it's important to understand uh, for me that that there there is no right or wrong anymore. You know, and that you 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 get along with that. You know, and that you accept it. That there is no right and there is no wrong. And that the world is just complex. And I think I think that 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 a lot of things that we see right now as a result of the pandemic is basically also that people can't deal with the complexity. You know, that mm-hmm. they they have a tendency to to uh, to look for a, a leader that which makes everything more simple to them. You know, and explains them the the, the world in a sim- in simple terms, right? Um, and and I I think I think that's that's what, what 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 it's it's a reaction to that to that complexity and so I think we we really have to understand we have to deal with it and we have to embrace it and we have to see the opportunity in the complexity, um, mm. and and I think I think that's uh, already something that we should probably teach our children and 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 get you get used to, you know and that's also what I I tell tell my people you know that you know. Don't expect from me that I I simplify the world for you. Don't expect from me that I make it more stable for you, more consistent, because mm. the world is not stable. It's it's not it's it's not consistent. It's constantly changing, and and the only the only way how to deal with it is to accept it. You know, for so sure. that's how how I put myself in a more powerful position. Because as an entrepreneur, you always want to be in a position where you can change things and and not in a in a position of of to be powerless, right? And I I, I think we have we have the power to change. Mm. And that, that idea of um that idea of dealing with complexity and and kind of leaning into it and and almost as you say you know accepting it as a as a fact is um is something which uh, Karen and I were we were speaking about this previously in terms of uh and it would be great to kind of to hear more kind of about your organisation, Karen here, because dealing with I suppose complex networks of people in different countries around the world. It's almost, to some extent, ex- maybe accepting that there's not going to be a kind of simple solution, and almost accepting that those kind of relationships are going to be complex, and they will continue to become, you know, more and more complex as more people get involved in them. Um, but it'd be great, yeah, it'd be great to hear some more uh, from you on that side of things. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I have to say that dealing with people around the world is really difficult it's really complex but it's probably less complex than dealing with all the ingredients uh, you are made of when you're a woman when you're a mother when you're a scientist when you're a manager uh, when you're um, a, a wife okay so I've been dealing with complexity uh, maybe since the uh, my graduation, my PhD, since my first day at school, uh, at work, sorry. And so I've been dealing with complexity um, in my company at CA. Um, so when I had this opportunity to, to, to deal with other people in other countries, eventually it was not that difficult. <laughs> so how did I do? How did I manage? Did we lose? We may have lost Karen briefly there. A uh, little bit. She's now turned into this picture on our screens, so we can uh, we can come back to her when she's uh, able to to join again. Uh, I can see that she's coming. Hello. Again. Here we go. You know, you're back. You're back. <laughs> so even my com- computer is complex, <laughs> <laughs> but this platform is great. I have to say. Well, so the solution, I think, is to trust yourself first. And, you know, before the confinement in France, I thought that I reached uh, a very good balance in my life because I managed to deal with all these uh, pieces of myself. I was... I feel I was feeling great. I was feeling good. So I was uh, just asking my, my team, what can I do for help? So that's that's really wonderful. When you're a manager, I think your, 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 your job is to just to ask, what can I do for you? So, and then COVID, back at home, husband, children, students, uh, kitchen, and <laughs> back to the, uh, you know, 19, the 50s. So I was dealing with the food, 
with uh, the house cleaning and with my job. And my husband was dealing with, I don't know, the, the garden and it was totally ridiculous. So after all these battles, after all these fights for the emancipation of women, uh, for the gender equality, back to what? So I just wanted to say that because I, I'm not vulnerable. You know, I've got a job, I've got a family, and after uh, a little chat around uh, with my children and my husband, everything went well, <laughs> went back to normal. But how it is for these women uh, so vulnerable with very difficult jobs, you know, and so COVID is a disaster. And this is why we really have to teach our children uh, and we really have to fight all together to help and to, we can't just take it for granted. It's not over at all. For sure. And I, I think that point of, uh, you know, people's personal lives and professional lives becoming more intertwined at this time, I think that's something which it feels like a lot of people are, are dealing with and it's, it's something which is... Uh, yeah, in impacting you know on both sides. That's something which for you, Wayne, over in over in Los Angeles, um, how, I mean, just, um, how have you found that there's been um, an interaction between the kind of uh, I suppose yeah. the personal and the professional during this time during the pandemic? Can just can I just add one thing because I just wanted to to end on a more positive note, uh, okay. and I'm, I totally agree with uh, Rolf. Complexity makes you stronger, so it's good. That's all. <laughs> Agreed. I agree with that, Karen. And so, so when what's what's been uh, what's been happening for you? So I think that um, you know there is a saying that uh, you know grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference and. Mm. If we're all in the same situation to try to find stability in this in, instable time. And um, I think that uh, you know, for us right now, we're trying to figure out not necessarily the short term answers to the instability, but also a more longer term solution and trying to find the solution that could be a compromise between what we would originally have done versus what we have to do now mm. or to and bridge the gap between now and the, and the future. So, um, you know, solutions like, you know, instead of like uh, working at home for a temporary basis, now we've moved all of our employees to permanent moving, working at home. So that like there's some stability and knowledge that they, even if COVID goes away, we have remote working capabilities for all of our staff, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about trying to make certainty out of the uncertainty and find solutions for that. For sure, for sure, and and as you say, given the fact that that things are changing, and given there's a an element of uh, flux and and change on a day to day basis, uh, directing that towards what you can control, and and kind of sustain is maybe the way the way through this. You know, kind of identifying what are those things that that can be done, and then as you yeah. say, maybe putting them in place uh, yeah. to provide some structure or to build in some structure. Right. Would that would that be right? Is that is that kind of yeah. a good characterization yes and and how do you um in terms of kind of when everything is changing like this in terms of i suppose your your personal view of how you prioritize what you're going to to focus on so something like that uh remote working policy is it you know it, was that something which you felt was a kind of an absolute priority in terms of like the, the culture of your business or was that a like a financial decision or what, how did you decide that that was the thing that you needed to, to do now and to focus on? I, w I was on a call and I think that um, there was indications that, you know, the gig economy was growing and people wanted to be more independent and they wanted more freedom and flexibility in their work arrangements and stuff like that. And, and I think that this kind of, I was always thinking about it and I felt like, you know, this is a good time to provide structure for the long term for all the employees mm. uh, and then provides an opportunity because now like all the all the companies are we're all in the same boat as like you know Karim has said is that you know we we there is no differentiation between you know people who want to work at home and who don't want to work at home they're all working at home right so then it becomes 
uh, a decision of whether that's going to be temporary or, or permanent. And mm-hmm. just to show that, like, you know, 50% of the population in the, it's in the United States, you know, want to work at home. When COVID hit, it's like 60%. That said, oh, this is nice, and I'd rather work at home. And then there was another poll that indicated that seventy percent would look for another job mm. if they were forced back to work. So then, uh, I mean, that's a lot. I mean, two thirds of the population want to work at home. So it became a no brainer for us to try to step up our investments in, you know, computers and printers and you know, um, yeah, hardware and software to make that possible. So that like the employees now know that um, it's not a temporary basis. It's more of a semi-permanent basis. Obviously, when COVID is over and there's a capability of having meetings in the office, that they'll come to the office. But ultimately, in the end, at least for the next couple of years, they're going to be working at home and you know adjusting to that so that there's no, there's no like temporary basis so they can set up their home offices or however they want to you know, manage their time and, and, and workload. That's how they manage their time and workload. And do you think that, did that change, I suppose, was that a change for you in terms of your perspective? Was that something that you were leaning towards anyway before this? Do you think that this crisis has meant that, you know, has it accelerated that? Has it uh, maybe changed your mind around flexible working? Yes, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that um, it, uh, it demonstrated that people can work at home at a high level, with efficiency, efficacy that uh, would parallel what they would do in the office, um, and then obviously we would have we have you know software and tools to manage all that to make sure that um, you know people are working to the level that they should be working at, um, given all of the hardware and software requirements that like we we provided to them. So uh, there's uh, new hiring practices. We're growing, like I said, we're in home fitness, so. We're up 500% versus last year. So we've hired a tremendous amount of people uh, through uh, virtual interviews as well as, you know, creative ways of incentivizing our employees to to dr- pull in their, their friends and family or whoever that is willing to work and not accept the, the what do you call it, the high unemployment rate that, you know, is kind of preventing people from going back to work, right? So um, we're not really necessarily competing against other companies. We're competing against the government and their unemployment checks, which is ridiculous, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, all that stuff we want to incentivize creative. Like today is Mid-Autumn Festival. I sent out mooncakes to all of our employees uh, yeah. to give them thanks because uh, Mid-Autumn Festival in Asia is kind of their Thanksgiving it's a time to harvest and provide thanks for all the hard work and efforts and energy that everybody has provided mm. uh, during the summertime. Yeah. Right. That sounds like a really great initiative. And, yeah. it, and it's like, so if Wayne has, has it almost feels like you've looked at, uh, you've looked at the market and you've seen kind of various trends going on and, and various uh, needs coming from, I suppose, in the employees in terms of what they're looking for in terms of their work. And then you've adapted your organization in relation to that and kind of prioritized your, uh, your spending and your operations in accordance to, to what the market is saying. Um, does anyone else on our panel have any other ways in which they kind of look at during times like this? You know, is there a, uh, in the same way as some organizations might almost have a kind of crisis mode, uh, operating model you know where they go anytime there's a big period of change we do this this and this in a certain order you know is there is there anything which your organizations have like that which is which is different to looking out to the broader market and, re- and reacting accordingly or is that potentially the right way to, to go about things Rob, what are your thoughts um so, so i think i think generally i think we, what we're trying to do at trivago is that we try to build the company and that was the case even before COVID mm. build the company in a way that it can develop and change as fast as possible. So we saw like change and learning, building a learning organization, mm. building an organization that co- can constantly adapt. Uh, that is, that's basically the most important thing that I, I think I did over the last five years. 
Mm. Um, and that comes with, I think, with enormous implications for how you structure an organization. Um, so in my, in my opinion, my opinion is that in these extremely like uh, complex and challenging times, and this is extreme high dynamic, basically, mm. and it's tr extreme ex external effects. I think the, the organization has to be built in a way that um, an organization has to be able to, to be modularized. So you, you have to put it into, into small atomic kind of units in one hand. Mm. And then these atomic units have to have the chance to flourish and to die, you know, and you have to give them the chance to flourish and to die. Mm. Because otherwise, if these, if these atomic units, they don't have the chance to flourish and to die, then the whole organization will die, you know, mm. like, and if, if you have an, an external shock, you know, then, then you have to, the, the way to react to an external shock and, and to flourish out of it. It's basically that give you give the organization from within the possibility that you you close down units and you and you and you, you shift resources very quickly from one to another, you mm -hmm. know and and um, and that comes again with a lot of implication then like okay how how's how's your structure built um, how's your what what kind of leadership philosophy do you have mm -hmm. uh, what kind of confidence and security do you provide to to your people right because if everybody is always afraid to lose their job. You know, then then you also uh, are in an environment where where it's very very deal, uh, hard to deal with change, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to provide. On one hand, you have to provide security that that you know people will have a job. On the other side, you have to expect from them to be able to change very quickly mm -hmm. in what they do, right? Sure, sure. And I, I was thinking, Karam, with your with your learning focus and your kind of e-learning uh, focus in terms of that, I thought that was an interesting, there's maybe an interesting crossover there around, I suppose, preparing people for mm -hmm. potential movement into new areas within an organization like, you know, one like Travago, for example, that Rolf, that Rolf mentioned. Yeah, I, I actually, my thought was going to some of the things that Rolf mentioned. You mentioned adaptive, so that's what we do, adaptive learning. So mm -hmm. that's what the system helps uh, do. But uh, before I go to that, um, as you mentioned, Rolf, uh, you use the word, let's go back to the biology, uh, like organism. And, uh, and James, you said, how do you, or are you preparing your organization to be in crisis mode? And I think yeah. like the human body, um, it's my background, I'm a medical doctor as well, um, before I started the company. Um, it, if you're in crisis mode, it's obvious the body is not, doesn't handle stress very well for a longer period of time. So one of the things we decided at Area 9 to do very quickly was to, as Ralph said, be in non-crisis mode. Obviously, there's a crisis, but knowing that a, a, a virus like this needs a vaccine, that will take a lot of time. So early on, we said, all right, this is the state of affairs. We will send people home. We did that very early in all our offices. We were ready for it as Royal Forces um, and many other organizations are. And then actually quickly encourage people, not three months later, but ourselves uh, with my, uh, our CEO, I was actually living with him. We moved into him. I was, li I was living in New York. He's in Boston. So I decided to, with my family, with their consent to move up to him. And we started to have most of our calls while we walked uh, with our team. So we had two hours of walks every day to make it okay that you can go to the forest and have your calls. Obviously not with clients, but more internally, right? Yeah. And I think showing that quickly, early, that, you know, stay in shape uh, to <laughs> power tech, right? Um, and, um, and, um, and, and don't be in crisis. We are all in a crisis, back to my first point, or we are in the same boat. Yeah. And then and then I think you can employ all the techniques that companies have, right? Uh, Trivago has their own, we have our own, but 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 being in a in, in a in a crisis mode and crisis leadership, um, yeah. um, we haven't uh, we haven't set kind of the tone to be that. Of course, we have still targets. We had targets last year, we need to meet, we need to exceed them. So yeah. that's still the the language we use, but but also making sure that people take care of themselves and we ourselves taking care of ourselves. So I was thinking of you, Karen, when you mentioned wives. Uh, I'm I was not so good at cooking. I'm still not good at cooking, but at least I think uh, one thing that my wife 
did get as a good surprise of this was that I did contribute much more than I used to do. And I'm also noticing that even with my small kids, I can actually spend more time. So I spend a lot of time thinking, what is this doing to those who have small kids, right? Like myself, four and eight. What will happen with this generation? Because a full year in this mode will influence them. Right. Um, and I don't know the answer there, but I'm, I'm observing and seeing what can I do myself? What are others doing to, to build also better structures at home? for post-COVID, while I'm preparing the company to be ready also post-COVID. So I would love to hear, uh, I don't know what your family situations are, but, but any, any, I don't know, advice, what are you doing to structure yourself for being ready post-COVID privately as well? Because I know the companies, we're doing tons, right? Sure. So what are we doing privately? So I'm, as I said, I, I started to bake a little bit. So that's one of the skills I'm upskilling myself on. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to hear from from Wayne and, and Karen on that on that point. What what are things like personally, and how are how are you um, how are you? Well, I've got many things to say. Many, many, many. But first of all, to answer your question, yes. Mm -hmm. you, well, it was really, really interesting to to hear that you, you changed something in your life due to this crisis, and and I did the same. I really did the same, but I was really in control of everything and I think that I have changed I, I try to look at the birds I try to stop you know um, managing everything so I just trust uh, my husband uh, my, my children have got three one one is only 10 but I've got um, a daughter she's um, 20 oh dear and my oldest son is uh, 23 so it's difficult for them because you know the, the my son is looking for a job. It's just graduate um, uh, engineer, and uh, the other she she just wants to see uh, her friends, but she can't. <laughs> and the little one she just doesn't understand what's going on. But well, so yes, um, taking the opportunity of this crisis to 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 put. The, the, the human in, uh, at the core of everything is really important. Mm -hmm. And this is what I do. And I think that every organization has to do the same. So I work uh, uh, at uh, CEA, which is the, the, the first research and technology organization uh, in France. So uh, I'm in the uh, re technology research uh, unit. Uh, we do trans uh, technology transfer and I think that one thing I really appreciate uh, in my company that they, in at the beginning of the crisis and even now, they they stop everything and, and they just concentrate it on the employees. And I really, really appreciated the fact that uh, I, I found uh, them uh, very flexible uh, in every kind of uh, rules. Mm. And that's a very positive point, and I, uh, I really I wouldn't have imagined that <laughs> for my company, which is a very traditional company. Um, so what I want to say as well is that once it's done, you know, with the people and your employee, you have to. Ralph, you took a sip of your beer, and she, Karen left. Yeah, she didn't like. She didn't like the taste. I, I'm sure she will. She will die away. Come back. Um, Wayne, in terms of on on that kind of personal side of things, what are your, your thoughts? Karen, you're back. Hello, Karen. Hello, I'm still here. Should we let let's quickly jump onto onto Wayne and we can come yeah. back to Karen shortly. Yeah. Okay. A little better. Uh, <laughs> what are your What are your thoughts, Wayne, in terms of um, you know, this, if we're thinking about, uh, there, there seems to be, you know, a lot going on in terms of people's personal relationships with their workplaces. As you mentioned before, you know, there's more flexibility. Um, I think there's also been a, you know, a drive towards more, uh, there's kind of a global change, I suppose. You know, there's, there's lots of discussions at the moment you see across the news, across international organizations about how this will shift things. Uh, on a global basis or on a local basis. Um, what are your thoughts on a, a, 
a kind of national and a regional basis. Do you think this will have, do you think this pandemic will have an effect on that? Do you think it will, you know, change people's political stance? Uh, there's obviously been, you know, a lot of moves towards things like isolationism, protectionism, these kind of uh, policies and ideas coming out. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what your perspective is. Is that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's certainly the pandemic has, I, I mean, to go back to kind of like the, the decision on employees is, is mm. because the employees are people. I mean, our, our, our mission at PowerTech is to be committed to stronger lives, whether that physically, mentally, emotionally, and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. with schools out and like, you know, there's there's no possible way that employees could come back and work and while taking care of their children at home. So, you know, it was it was very, very deliberate decision to make sure that their families are protected and their families are well taken care of while they're going through this challenge. Uh, I think that, um, you know, uh, an organization is made up of people. So, you know, taking care of the people, you know, the, the people will take care of take care of the organization. That's a yeah. firm belief of that. The yeah. challenge is that um, there's all these other external macroeconomic factors, political factors that are kind of causing some challenges. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> whether right or wrong, Trump has his own agenda and viewpoints on China. Um, yeah, I, I'm divorced. I have an older older daughter here in the U.S. who's 12 and a half. And uh, during this time, it's been great bonding with her and everything. But also, I have a five-year-old and a newborn son in China. I mean, yeah. I was supposed to be there on April for his birth, obviously to, because of the whole, whole lockout of uh, the American citizens or all citizens out of China. I was not able to be there Yeah, uh, birth. And then... You know, on top of that, you have the trade tariffs, you have the you know, embargoes, you have the shutting down of the embassy in Houston and in like uh, in, in central China, and they have all the spies being caught. And, I mean, it's just a it's just a political mess, and it's causing um, this rift between the U.S. and China. I, I believe that the past administrations wanted to keep China closed, so it's intertwined, so that they would not make any type independent decision that would cause it challenges between that but with this bifurcation between the US and China now because Trump wants to be you know not dependent or codependent on China as much anymore it's, yeah. it's allowing China to be a lot more um, what do you call it um, brave or a lot more uh, independent in making their decisions so um I don't know how that's going to play out from a from a political and military standpoint. Mm. It's, it's it's going to be a big challenge for 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 those for the Sino American relationships, um, and it's going to be a big challenge for me. I mean, I I'm a business owner, so in a lot of ways, I benefit from 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 a lot of the Trump's policies, economic policies. Yeah, but again, you know, as a minority, even in California where there is a strong minority base, I still feel a little bit uh, less safe as I did under previous administrations. Um, so, you know, from a personal standpoint, you know, I was I was against guns, um, but now considering what's going on and you know talks about like you know riots in the streets and stuff like that, I'm contemplating buying one. Right, so it's. Um, it's something that is shifting my personal belief system because of the situation and environment that we're in. Mm. Uh, ultimately, in the end, you know, there are some benefits and costs to it. Like, I'm much closer to my 12-year-old, but much more distant from my 5-year-old who's in China. For sure, for sure. And has, has anyone else, like, in terms of working across borders um, and what this pandemic has, has, I suppose, done to that, impacted that, uh, change that is there anything that you can point to and feel free to kind of jump in if, for who this is this would be relevant to you know is there anything that has um has shifted as a result of what's going on that you think will have a, a kind of significant impact on your business has there been any uh you know either any kind of legislation brought in or have the um you know any of the regulations or guidelines impacted uh, your business i imagine on the on the travel side of things potentially wrong that might have uh, 
might have had it. Yeah, with, with, without it, without a doubt that um, that this, of course, impacted us a lot. But, uh, but I think, besides from, I think how it impacted us, us as a company. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I I would think this is still, and maybe I'm too positive, uh, but I think this is still a, a, a you know could could be uh, something that. You know, let, let let me let me go the other way. Um, I I think you usually when 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 you as an individual, um, when you make a big step ahead, you usually do that in a crisis situation, right? So yeah, I don't know when you when you are at the end of a relationship or uh, when your job goes downhill or whatsoever. So I think at least for me, that was basically when I made the biggest steps forward as a as a person, mm. and uh, and I think that also um, this kind of pandemic could be potentially uh, something that is kind of like evolving as us as a global society. Um, and I think, I think it can be, and I think it is already a big unifier, even if it might not seem in that situation like it. Mm -hmm. But I think it is a unifier because we all kind of like, we go through the same experience. And we were all sitting at home, you know, where, wherever you were in the world, we were all sitting at home at the same time. Mm. We all were fighting the same enemy. And I think that's, that's rarely happening. You know, it's rarely happening that uh, such a clear situation, you know, because usually we fight some, some other country or whatsoever, or some policies or so, right? But in this case, we have kind of a common enemy. Um, and even if it's not maybe yet the big unifier, because you have this kind of nationalistic tendencies yeah mm -hmm. i think then it's at least at least it's a it's a very good yardstick for what kind of policies work in such an environment and what do not work and if you have a good yardstick and if you can measure something like you can basically in this situation you know like how you have to deal with these problems in the future and i think that is something that that might maybe be more important than than the struggle, at least the economic struggle, not the personal, but the economic struggle that we have right now. That might be more important learning for the future. Mm. Uh, that 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 I think I think that we 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 really like that we learned that you you cannot talk these problems away. You know, you cannot just blame it on somebody and and you cannot just like 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 talk over it or so. And because it will not go away, you know, it would not will not solve itself. You know, and I think I think that's that's very powerful. I think it's very powerful. You know, because it it's a uh, you know it's like in my in my company we, we try to make every single action measurable mm. to be able to learn from it. You know, and in this case we have a common enemy, and you see the differences and the in the different policies and how they how and, and and what they do. I think that is that is at least an opportunity to learn with all the grief that we have and and. and 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 making making that clear, right? That that this is this is of course a very very difficult situation. But on the other side, I think it's a it's a great opportunity for us to evolve. Yeah, and I would say for us, it has been actually it has accelerated the ease of connecting with people anywhere in the world um, because, as um, Roger mentioned, we are we are very equally in the same situation, um, and then. Um, because everyone, including parents, are seeing how important um, learning actually is. I mean, we send our kids to school, but we don't know exactly what's going on. We have an idea about what's going on. Now everyone is seeing it. And the surprise that many parents have seen uh, around online learning, um, obviously I'm in that space, so I've seen it in my own kids as well, yeah. that has actually led to a... Uh, uh, extreme drive to what we call reliable remote learning. So what can you rely on that actually have evidence that it works? Mm. And I think that um, if, you're, if you're not in crisis mode and you don't go into crisis mode and you can explain uh, calmly w what it takes to do something that actually works, mm. that gives um, enormous opportunities. And also continents like in Africa that we have generally not touched um, uh, for the last few years, we're now also, you know, having the right dialogues there because um, more than ever they also need it, right? Because else we'll lose 
a whole um, piece of a generation as well. So sure. I think, um, yeah. Sure. Karen? And, and, and yeah, on, on that uh, subject of learning, I was going to say. Yes, I would like to say that um, to, to jump on what you just said, um, uh, at uh, the high level for Arming Renewable, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, considering the crisis, we decided to launch a series of uh, interaction between the, the different ecosystem, innovation ecosystem, uh, uh, all, all over the world. And we we will be giving the, the first briefing on three very crucial questions of our time on the 1st of December. So it will be the first time uh, we will dis discuss uh, a subject that, you know, not only locally, but globally, uh, uh, benchmarking um, uh, ecosystem all over the world. So the three categories of uh, questions are the resilience of innovation ecosystem, the winning technologies of the crisis, and what kind of new uh, strategic alliances uh, can we make now right after the crisis because we have to change and this is really important so it, it shows that uh, we have increased considerably the the the, uh, the need to um, work all together uh, to make it better um, uh, where we live you see so this is really important, this connection and this kind of interaction, because, you know, we, we can't just wait for the governments, uh, the different governments to agree on things. Okay. So you, you said that we learn from the crisis. Yes, we are learning, but everybody uh, deals with this crisis so differently, every government. So we really have to work all together to propose solutions to governments so they can maybe adapt them themselves. And that, that idea to, to um, mm. link between what you were saying, Karen, and what you were saying, Karim, about um, mm. those you mentioned, Karim, about uh, the fact that everyone's on the screen, for example, puts them on some sort of level footing because everyone's, everyone's been sat at home. Yeah. Uh, and Karen, you were saying about, you know, leveling up with, uh, I suppose, with governments and, you know, and not not necessarily having to wait for yeah. do you Do you think overall... Um, and I'm getting a big thing saying time is up with two minutes to go. Um, do you think that this crisis has kind of empowered people? Do you think it, you know, do you think it is a leveler in terms of bringing people up? Or do you think this is something where it's kind of maybe brought some of the institutions down in terms of uh, people's idea of their, their power, I suppose, and their power structures? I think that this crisis will empower people, definitely, but we need to resist. <laughs> and so we need to propose solutions and we need to write position papers to support uh, industrial policies, to support it, higher education policies mm. and to, to, to spend... Uh, um, you know, um, on long-term progress, because, you know, short-term, we don't know what's going to happen within two days. So it's all about long-term, long-term education first. So with the, with the a minute and a half we have left, I just wanted to go uh, through each of you and, and just maybe get one very quick thing, a sentence or so, on one thing that you'll take forward from this in your organisation, thinking about the kind of the long-term stability of your organisation. What will be one thing you'll change? Uh, given everything that's happened in the last six months? That's probably quite a hard question to answer succinctly in a minute, but we can try it. I'm, I'm going to bring our community more uh, together on a more regular basis. That's going to be the biggest thing uh, for me. I think uh, one word um, that I think, Karen, you also mentioned, oh, vulnerability. And uh, let's remember that that no matter, uh, I know we're all entrepreneurs as well, how strong we are, yeah. that uh, preparing for always what will happen and how do you make sure that you you can fight the vulnerability that we, we are now experiencing for sure. to some extent. How about you, Rob? Let's be aware how fast things can change. Great. And Wayne, if we finish with you, what will you be taking forward? I think that's like, um, you know, we all have to trust each other because we're all in the same boat in this complex world and situation. Trust. 
Thank you very much for all. Uh, all you. Maybe I can say one word. <laughs> sure. Two Technology, technology is for good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and moving in the right direction to achieve uh, the things that we want to achieve. Um, thank you very much for your time, guys. Um, I know we're, we're getting people in at different time zones around the world, so I really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join this evening. Thank you, James. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, James. It was a pleasure. Yeah, Take thanks. Yeah. Have a very good weekend to all of you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.